thought I would uh, forever be a doctor. I thought that was my path. I always like to say I was kind of Korean into staying pre-med. Knocked up. Well, I remember I put myself on tape and uh, Judd Apatow, the writer-director, was looking for an actor with medical experience. So I, I remember putting myself on tape for Knocked Up and I didn't hear for three months. So I figured I didn't get the role. And then I got a call three months later from one of Judd's producers saying that you're in the running, you're in the mix, but we're actually about to start production right now and while we're making decision on your character, um, we're inviting you to do a table read. And it was a table read with the full cast, like Seth Rogen, it was Adam Scott, it was, um, Jonah Hill, Jason Siegel, Craig Robinson. It's, I mean, that movie, Knocked Up had everybody. I call it the Avengers of comedy. You know, it literally, anybody who's anybody in today's comedy was, was in that movie. So it was really like the, the maybe the most pressure-filled audition of my life. Like maybe five days later, I got the part. I actually prepared pretty extensively for that role. I mean, I modeled it after a few a few doctors I didn't particularly care for <laughs> that I've worked with in the past, <laughs> to be honest. In a doctor-patient relationship, to be healthy, one should not ask the doctor too many questions. Okay. You got that, Ben? You're not the star of I'm this sorry, show. I know, I'm sorry, just go on. Who is a star of this show among the three of us? The patient. I actually, I think I wrote some of those doctors' names on the script, to, if I can recall, and it just kind of locked me in, and uh, it was a bit of medical authenticity, plus my first real experience into actor prep, you know, and really kind of kind of getting into the skin of that character. It's still one of my favorite performances uh, to this day, yeah. Judd Apatow, he, I mean, he's one of the most amazing directors I've ever worked with. He spoils you. He spoils the actors because um, he really does let the talent play. Judd noticed that um, on, on on certain takes, he would just see me like go out of comedy, go out of take really hard, and um, and Judd would be like, "Okay, that's a little too strong." But and then he actually said to himself, like, "You know, wow, he he's bringing. It. I didn't know he could do that sort of comedy. I wasn't looking for him to do that kind of comedy in this movie." And after a while, he just uh, uh, he said, "Ken." You know, we got 10 minutes left to tape of, of film. Just do whatever you want. And that became its own DVD feature. And you see me just going unhinged. It's called Cooney Gone Wild. It's like literally five minutes and 46 seconds of just, just like Cooney yelling at Seth Rogen and Katherine Heigl and Adam Scott, who played my nurse. And I'm here for you because I took the motherfucking oath to serve and protect. Non malfeasance, bitch! We're gonna have a good time, okay? Like a U2 concert, okay? All right, I'm gonna take a big fat nap now because you called me. It, it was still one of the highlights of my career, and uh, and even getting applause by the set at the end. It's just, yeah, the more I. I yeah, wow. That, I hadn't thought about that in a while. The Office. It was, his name was Bill, and. He was in Michael Scott's improv group, and the director was Paul Feig. But I remember um, I was a big fan of the BBC Office, big fan of Ricky Gervais's version of the, you know, the original version of The Office. And uh, that time when I auditioned for The American Office, it was not necessarily a hit at that time. And um, it kind of, people kind of forget it became a hit very slowly. And, uh, and I was one of the few people that really got the tone of that show just from the get-go. So when I auditioned, I, I whispered every line and I would look directly to camera, just kind of steal a glance. I remember stealing a couple of subtle glances and I remember Paul Feig laughing so hard at the softest things. Michael, what did you tell him? Nothing. Then why are his hands up? Bill? He told me he couldn't show it to me, but he has a gun. Steve Carell, he's one of my favorite actors of all time. He's, he's, he's a huge influence on me, whether, I mean, I've known Steve now for a few years. He probably doesn't want to hear that from a peer. He's so modest. You know, I know, actually, I know he doesn't want to hear stuff like that. I mean, he'll probably watch that, me saying that right now and be like, oh, come on, Ken, come on, man. Yeah, so he's that, like, modest about it. But um, he, he, it really was, um, in basketball terms, it was, it was it's like working with LeBron, man. You're just working with just one of the all-time greats. And to improvise during 
an improv class. What they were doing was next level stuff. Some of Steve's friends from Second City that, you know, of his class at Second City, they were also guest stars on the show. And they had this rapport and this chemistry. I'm supposed to meet my doctor here. Have you seen him? He's a very angry midget. Boom, freeze. Michael Schoon, FBI, you know what you did. Boom, boom, oh. boom. They were putting on a master class of improv comedy acting. And to this day, I don't think I've, I've ever seen anything like that. It was kind of masters at work. And I, I just had like the best seat in the house. Role models. Role models is uh, maybe my favorite movie that enough people don't mention. You know, um, it w I did that movie soon after Knocked Up, and uh, I did a lot of research for that role. I don't know anything about LARPing or live action role playing or any of those things, so I went to a few events in Malibu and just studied it. And take some pride in dying an honorable death. No, but, but I killed you. You can't kill me after I already killed you. Davith of Glen Kraken. Yes, my liege. This he slay me. He doth not slay the king. It got to a point I knew so much about live action role play, I would start improvising and LARP speak and because I played the king of this whole village or uh, of this whole country of Casadonia. King! It's that guy from the burger hole. Aw, he seems to be wounded. Shall I take him out, sire? Nay, this one is mine. I kind of stole a little bit of Mr. Chow moves from the king because I did those movies like, um, like, like right after one another, yeah. The Hangover Trilogy, the movie that made me a made man. Hangover, it, it changed, you know, it's, it's my Sergeant Pepper, you know? It changed my life from black and white to Technicolor. It just, it just changed everything. If Knocked Up opened the door for me in the business, The Hangover just burst it wide open. And I went from, uh, you know, uh, a, a pretty anonymous character actor to a guy that's just, uh, for the rest of my life, I'll be forever known as Mr. Chow. No matter what I do, I'll be forever known. And I don't mind because it's still, I don't think I'll ever play a, like, just kind of, just gut busting, hilarious character. I don't think I'll ever, I don't think I'll ever play a character just balls out funnier, literally, balls out funnier character than Mr. Chow. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of lightning in a bottle. It was actually, people don't know this, it was actually written for a 60-year-old man. And, and I remember thinking to myself, well, A, I'm not going to get the part, so, but when you audition, 99% of auditioning, of acting, is getting rejected. And that's just the name of the game. But you want to at least do a good performance, and maybe Tom Phillips will think of me for another role in the future. So that, I, I went in with that mindset. You know, we'll just see what happens and... Uh, and just, I just remember Todd Phillips couldn't stop laughing, and I think literally the next day or two I got the part. And uh, again, keep in mind, we did not know The Hangover would be The Hangover at that time. I remember telling my wife, like, I think I just filmed the funniest movie ever. I asked her, told my wife, I don't know if you'll like it. I think this might be like a guy's comedy. I, I, I don't know. And then, and I remember um, we watched an early screening with friends and family, and Trey and my wife, the moment where Bradley Cooper says, Tracy, we fucked up, like boom, Tran laughed. She just could not stop laughing. She got it, she got what it was all about, and it was off to the races. I did about at least 35 to 40 takes of me jumping out naked from different angles and different things, and that was my idea to be naked in the movie. It was just, I just felt like when he jumps out of the trunk, it said he had slacks on. And I was like, well, if he just jumps out like fully naked, it'd just be shocking, and I do remember. Uh, I even said, I actually talked it over with my wife. I said, like, I, th I think, you know, I want to do this naked. So I actually ran it by her before I ran it by Todd Phillips. And, then, and she said, and I quote, it'll be the feel-good movie of the summer because every guy will go home feeling good about themselves. And that's my wife, the mother of my two kids. So, so when I pitched it to Todd to be naked in the movie, he was like, and he's got a very deep voice, he's like, you don't have to tell me twice. That was his actual words. And he made me sign a, an agreement to be naked in the movie, that this was my idea, and I'm doing this voluntarily, but also that I couldn't change my mind. So he just knew it would be the perfect 
moment, midpoint in the movie, after they had already seen Mike Tyson, they already saw the tiger, what could be worse? It was like, oh, what, what the hell is this going on? Chow is, this guy is just jumped out naked and just beat up three people with a crowbar. It's like, it's just, it just added to what, what was already a suspenseful movie. To me, it's, it's it, there's just a lifelong bond, I think, that will, that, that will, that will last forever on celluloid, you know? It's, yeah, it's a, it, it was a magical time, and it just, um, it, it just, it just changed my life forever. I mean, the moment The Hangover came out, I was starting to get instantly recognized. Bring money to Big Rock in Mojave Desert at dawn. What? Toodaloo, motherfucker. Hey, you, you can't. I was at an ATM withdrawing some cash, and this um, guy's looking at me from a sedan with the window half, half cracked open, not a paparazzi, just staring at me, withdraw some cash. I'm uncomfortable staring at me, withdraw some cash, staring at me. The light turns green, and he goes, toodaloo, motherfucker, like that. That, I get that all the time. That's like every day for me now, every day. Community, six seasons, and I'm still waiting on that movie. I remember Dan actually had seen an outtake of Knocked Up, where Judd Apatow gave me a free take. He wrote the part of Senior Chang with me in mind. Kind of, he liked that place of authority with a little bit of unhinged. I would do takes on community that was completely unhinged and improvisational. Contrary to popular belief, I mean, you actually don't, Im you don't improvise much in, 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 on, on television in general. I didn't really know that. I was like, community was my first TV series. I remember the first, my first moment as Senior Chang, um, where it's like, why do you teach Spanish? And it, that is all mostly improvised. Well, I'll tell you why I teach Spanish. It is none of your business, okay? And I don't want to have any conversations about what a mysterious, inscrutable man I am. <laughs> I am a Spanish genius. In Espanol, my nickname is El Tigre Chino. Dan told me later he was just furious because those are his words, carefully written words. After I realized um, that's not how you do it in television and that's not how Dan wants it, pretty soon thereafter I stopped improvising on that show. And it was at that point where I developed just true confidence as an actor. I knew who I was. And um, because even though I was doing movies, there were, there were small parts in these movies and um, I never had formal acting training at Duke because I, I, I remember you know turning down you know, the Duke School of Acting. So I always thought of community as my conservatory. Boz Burgers is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, play a recurring on that show, Dr. Yap. And um, uh, Lauren Bouchard, he, he wrote the part of Dr. Yap from, with me in mind. And, uh, and, uh, and I, love doing, I love doing animation, I love doing voiceovers. I had a patient in here earlier and I accidentally stuck a needle through his cheek. Just I hate Mondays. Oh. In some of the movies I've done, um, like Turbo, Despicable Me 2, Penguins of Madagascar, I'm usually by myself. And I remember the first time I did Boss Burgers, it was with the entire cast. And um, that was the first time I'd ever done animation like that, which I love, just feeding off of everybody's energy. I really quite liked having everybody, you know, there, you know, and I try to, you know, I would like to do more of that if possible because you really feed off that energy, you really envision the whole scene. And, um, but the thing about Boss Burgers that I love is, again, much like Dan Harmon, the writing is so crisp, you know, and I'll always do it, no matter what. I mean, I, it's been through every phase of my career, like Community, Hangover Movies, Dr. Ken. I just did an episode this past season. I'll do it whenever they ask me, no matter how busy I am. Dr. Ken, I'll be honest, that was my proudest accomplishment because I created that show, it's based on my life. Um, he had, a show that had five Asian American series regulars uh, on a broadcast show that was based on my life, uh, working as, as a father, as a husband, as um, as a doctor, and I was in the writers' room every day. You know, I I remember Dr. Ken for if anything, if anything else, if Community made me a better actor, Dr. Ken made me a better writer. I would definitely help out with scripts and help break story and help uh, give notes on editing and time cuts and time notes. By the end of the series, I was doing not only the editing, but 
Uh, I remember the showrunner went on vacation for a couple of weeks and he trusted me enough to do the sound mixing. I mean, that's like real producer stuff. What I liked, it actually really helped me out as an actor because my improv is just very much just, you know, from self and just, I just, I just throw out the kitchen sink. And now when I improvise, I really pick and choose my spots. I'm a little bit more precise. I don't need to be gratuitous and just show everybody, hey, look at what I can do, you know? And I feel even more matured as, as an actor. And that comes actually from writing. Crazy Rich Asians. Um, when Dr. Ken got canceled, I, John Chu uh, called me, called me for, gave me the part. And, um, and I, I'm a big fan of the books by, by Kevin Kwan. So within moments of that cancellation, I'm on a flight to Singapore and Malaysia shooting that movie. In the very first scene, um, I, I think I was just, uh, I think I was processing like what had just happened on my own show. And it was so therapeutic. Nice to meet you too. Uh, Chu, Ku Ku, Could Chu, You. Poo poo. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not, I don't have an accent. I'm just messing with you. Crazy Rich Asians was another full circle moment because it was always a dream of mine to be a part of a movie like The Joy Luck Club, an all Asian American cast made by a Hollywood studio. And we're the first, coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, it was the first all Asian American cast in a major Hollywood studio film since The Joy Luck Club club 25 years prior and it becomes like the biggest romantic comedy in a decade it becomes the number one movie three weeks in a row I knew it was a great I knew even while filming it I knew it'd be a great movie because I I love the source material and the cast led by Constance Wu Henry Golding Michelle Yeoh and Aquafina. Um, I, I even while filming I knew it, I knew it'd be a good movie so I had no doubt in my mind I was just hoping people who weren't Asian would see it I, I did not. I did not know if it would cross over, and it did. With the, with and then some friends of mine who are Asian American filmmakers and writers and directors, they're getting their projects greenlit by major studios, by broadcast networks. It actually has made an impact. It it, it has moved the needle in the business, and um, just to be a part of it, a small part of it is, it, it's a very big deal, you know, and also. You know, I have two daughters, Alexa and Zoe, they're 11 years old, and they have these wonderful role models to look up to. You know, I'm quoting Nico Santos, who's in the movie of Superstore, and he says, um, this kind of movie, rising tides lifts all boats. And that's, you know, I, uh, whenever I think of Crazy Rich Asians, I think of that. The Mass Singer. The Mass Singer is the most popular, like, competition show in Korea and in Thailand. It also happens to be my, my mom's favorite show coming from Korean background and when I got offered the show I was like well it's not really it's not my thing you know at all and uh and my mom was like she showed me she she sent me links of the show it's she's like it's it's my it's my favorite show you you got to do this and I, I I was just kind of like okay this is not my thing and uh and I and I ended up just leap of faith. Like my mom was really like, my mom was like adamant. And we, we did this promo for for Fox Network. You're like, hi, I'm so and so. Hi, I'm Robin. Hi, I'm I'm Jenner. And then it comes to me. I literally look at the camera like, I honestly don't know what I'm doing here. On this show, I'm literally the dumbest guy alive. I don't know anything about anything. And there could be these amazing singers in these amazing costumes. And you, the whole point is to guess who this is. It's like a combo of American Idol, What's My Line, Concentration. It's like all like four like different genres. And um, I'm literally just getting paid to guess stupidly. I'm so freaking confused right now. I don't know who I am. You know, I'm like, uh, like I literally would do takes like this. You know, I think I know who this is. Senator Chuck Schumer, welcome to the Masked Singer. So like all my takes were like completely, I was just having fun, just having a laugh and just being completely stupid. And, um, and also hearing some amazing voices. And when you really get into like these are these are singers who are or maybe uh, performers who aren't known for singers. You don't you don't know who they are. I feel alive. It's kind of addictive to get into guessing who they are. Like I had my wife and kids come to a taping, and everyone is into it. And like even my manager, who 
like managers for a little secret, like when managers go to their, their clients' sets, you know, they don't want to be there. They're just there to show moral support and like, hey, buddy, you know. Like my manager went to every single taping. He was like, who do you, like, he'd be texting me, like while the show's going, is it, is it so-and-so and so-and-so? And like, it's like, dude, I thought you already left. My Netflix special, it's, it's one of my favorite things I've ever done. Um, again, it, it was all organic. It was something that I didn't even know if I wanted to do stand up full time. I just had a lot of daylight on my calendar after Dr. Ken ended and I was just restless and I was like, you know, maybe I'll just try stand up and see how that works. And I did a couple spot gigs and in, in clubs in LA and, and I just fell in love again with stand up. I'd done stand up comedy for 17 years prior to the first hangover. So it was a lot of full circle involved. Maybe it's the doctor part in me. I, I always compartmentalize if it's like, oh, community is my acting school. Maybe Dr. Ken is my fellowship, you know? And uh, maybe my Netflix special is my post-grad work. I don't know, it's like, I do, I do find myself like academically compartmentalizing a lot of my work. It's my own way of finding a deeper meaning to what I do than just, you know, just fame and fortune. You know, you, you, you want, you do this because you love it and you do it because it matters, you know, and it feeds your, for lack of a better word, it feeds your soul. You know, this is, this is what I